Let's go ahead and get started here. How's the first day of the conference for everyone so far? Good? Good? All right. So this session is Drupal in 2020 because I'm feeling ambitious. My name is Larry Garfield. You may know me online as Krell. If you want to make fun of me during the session that's uh, on Twitter, that's where you do so. I highly encourage it. Uh, does anyone not know who I am? So do I need to bother with the slide? You, <laughs> so for Peter O'Lannan, <laughs> my name is Larry Garfield. I'm a senior architect with Palantir.net. Uh, we're a Drupal agency based in Chicago. Uh, Drupal Aid Web Services Initiative Lead, uh, Drupal representative to the Framework and Interoperability Group, advisor to the Drupal Association, and a walking implementation of PSR 8. Only some people are going to get that joke here. <clears throat> Tell me about you right quick. Who here is, would call themselves a core developer? Only a handful of people. Contrib developer? Who has worked in a web, a web server language other than PHP? Decent number, okay. All right. Who's here just to make fun of me? <laughs> Peter O'Lanand again, I figured. So, Drupal 8. It's kind of a big deal. We've been talking about it for a long time. It's going to be a great release, and yeah, I, we should, this is something we should be proud of. All right? I'm going to say a lot of things in this session, but I want to make something clear. Nothing I take should be, in saying this session should be taken as a criticism of the people working on Drupal 8 who have done an amazing amount of work. Uh, actually, uh, those who, are, who have done Drupal 8 development, who have contributed to Drupal 8, can you stand up for a moment? <laughs> so so for, let's get, just get that out of the way first. Um, that said, yeah, as Dries said in his keynote, incidentally, I wrote this whole thing before the keynote happened, so I, I'm not updating it for that. Um, dear God, let's never go through that dev cycle again. <laughs> it, way too long, way too stressful, um, and probably the, the most relevant problem is that we spent four years not building great new functionality. We spent four years playing catch-up. Drupal 7 was well behind the curve, even when it was released, for where PHP was. And Drupal 8 has leapfro leapfrogged about eight or nine years forward from where we were, which means we're only about two years behind now. <laughs> what do I mean by behind? Well, WordPress had a decent REST API years ago. I don't even remember when they released it, but it's been a long time now. Joomla? They had, their, uh, had a release in 2012 that ha was fully responsive out of the box. These are things that Drupal 8 is finally adding, but we're the last to the table on these. There's a tweet from, overlapping a little, a little bit, a uh, tweet from someone who's retweeted by one of the content strategists I follow who works with a lot of different content management systems. And EpiServer, it's one of the big proprietary CMSs. It's one that, uh, you know, the, some people are very, very fond of, but this is all boring. All the stuff we're so proud of that we spent a ton of time on and did an amazing amount of work to do is boring functionality for an awful lot of the market. This is the barrier, you know, th this is the barrier to entry. This is cost of entry. Quite simply, the market is moving faster than we are, and we need to be able to move faster because the technology market and the tool chains are moving even faster than that. Just since we started development on Drupal 8 in March of 2011 at DrupalCon Chicago, just since then, the entire composer and packagist revolution has happened. The PHP Framework and Interoperability Group went from a small group of losers who had exactly one spec out called PSR0 to an actual force for good in the PHP community. I count myself in both groups. <clears throat> we had Symphony 2 released in that time. Symphony 2.0 came out after we started Drupal's uh, 8 development. It's been that long. And that was one of the uh, kickstarts for the PHP renaissance of the last several years. 
Flexbox wasn't even a thing. Wasn't even, it was a glimmer in someone's eye when Drupal 8 started. PHP 5.4 was released since Drupal 8 started and was deprecated and retired. And 5.5 um, is already on its last legs. And 5.6 is the current stable version. And I think looking at the calendar, PHP 7 is going to come out before Drupal 8 does. Internet Explorer 9 was released during the Drupal 8 dev cycle, as was 10, as was 11, as was Microsoft Edge. Microsoft released four web browsers in the time it took us to produce Drupal 8. <laughs> let, let, we need to get out in front of this. We need to not be playing catch up. We need to be thinking forward. We need to be looking at not where we're, we need to be to catch up. Where do we need to be a couple of years from now to be ahead of the curve? How do we get ahead of these tech cha technology changes? Or set ourselves up so that we can get ahead of them as soon as we notice them? That's the challenge. Now, the new release schedule for Drupal 8 is going to be a huge help. This is going to make it easier. Uh, this ties into the feature branch work that Dries was talking about in his keynote. But this has been on the plan for two years now. Actually, it was, yeah, DrupalCon Prague, we uh, settled on this. So when 8 comes out, we are not opening Drupal 9. We open 8.1, which is non-API breaking additions. And so we can add functionality and, and refactor things uh, without breaking APIs. So we don't need to wait four or five years between releases, which is a good thing. But that's not the entire story. That's not going to be the entire solution for us. The question we need to be asking is where does Drupal need to be in five years? Five years from now, when we we're at DrupalCon, I don't know where, what will the market look like? What will our customers be asking for? What will the technology stack look like? If we want to say we're a state-of-the-art platform in 2020, what does that even mean? And when we figure that out, how can we get to it as quickly as possible? How can we start moving that direction now incrementally so that we don't have to wait five years and then release another version and hope we got it right then? So, all right, so what, what do we need in five years? So I consulted a crystal ball on this one. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't work out so well. <clears throat> So let's, let's look at some trends and make some educated guesses. So what's the market looking, looking for? Well, who, who's read Dries' blog? OK, it's worth reading for the rest of you. Uh, this is uh, one of his recent really big posts, the big reverse of the web. He's been talking about this one all year, in fact. I believe that for the web to reach its full potential, it will go through a massive re-architecture and re-platforming. The future of the web is push-based, meaning the web will be coming to us. His basic thesis here is instead of you going to a website and looking up information, more and more sites will track you and push information to you through notifications on your phones, RSS feeds, uh, emails, um, technology that doesn't exist yet. The kind of stuff that Facebook and Google and Apple and Amazon are already doing, everyone's going to need to do to be competitive and we need someone who, who's not a multi-billion dollar corporation who can pull it off. So we need to be able to do push web. And we need to do it for the sake of the open web. Because I refuse to accept a future in which no one is allowed to do web development who's not a billion dollar corporation. So we need to exceed their user experience and take back control of our data while still offering this kind of functionality. And the way to do that is loosely coupled architectures with a highly integrated user experience. Loosely coupled architectures with a highly integrated user experience. The user should not be able to tell that it's a loosely coupled architecture. We're going to need to, to make it a loosely coupled architecture to be able to pull off this kind of fun functionality. Another trend, I'm seeing a resurgence of decoupled CMSs. Now, that's a decoupled CMS. I don't mean headless. I mean separating the editorial process from the presentation. Now, <clears throat> now, this could be static site generators, which are the oldest uh, variety. Those have seen a resurgence in recent years with uh, Jekyll, Sculpin, other tools like that. 
You could also have configurations where you have some kind of view-only application, where <clears throat> you have your editorial CMS that dumps data to some intermediary server, and then there's an, another application in front of it that's just doing read-only serves. Doing lots of complex stuff with it, but it's read-only, which means it can be a lot faster, a lot more optimized. Um, I've actually built systems like this using Drupal. It works. It's a little bit clunky. Um, uh, Theodore Bidala, Nod, was just up here two hours ago talking about that being the correct way to do headless, essentially. You can do twin installs, where you actually have an editorial Drupal and a front-end Drupal, a, a production Drupal, and synchronize content between them somehow. Uh, I know Dick Olson, is he here? Yeah, you, you've done this kind of stuff. I'm weird. What's that? I'm weird. He's weird, yeah. Um, but th there's a market need for this. I keep getting clients asking me for a content staging server. I usually push them towards workbench moderation instead, but a lot of them still want and some of them need separate installs. Um, could be completely separate uh, servers for, th for things, where your presentation server, you have six of them, but you have one content server. And that content server is basically a REST server for the content. The presentation apps are hitting that directly, give or take caching. And so you have separate apps, but they're still talking constantly. It's not a database sync. It's constant communication. All of these things exist in the market today. They're just not always easy to do. But this is important because one of the huge advantages of a decoupled approach is you can completely decouple your look and feel from your content storage. I mean, really, how many sites need, not just can, but need to change their user workflow and look and feel and their underlying content model at the same time, every time. Very few. We normally end up doing that because Drupal does both at the same time and couples them. If we split those up, then, oh yeah, Drupal 7, Drupal 8, redesign several times, Drupal 9 in here, whatever. The HTML, CSS, and user interaction, social media integration, all this kind of stuff are content delivery concerns. Content modeling, workflow, indexing, and so on are content management concerns. These are different needs, different types of applications that don't have to be in the same application. Sometimes you want them in the same, sometimes you don't. And then there is the question of headless, which it... I do recommend watching the video from Nod's talk earlier. He dissects this word uh, rather well. But a headless environment, we have some kind of pure JavaScript application that's just hitting Drupal over REST. That's going to be very high traffic. Dries was talking about this in his keynote earlier. REST is chatty. REST is a very chatty system by design. But if you don't want to custom build everything in terms of your API, which means you have to modify it every time you want to change anything, then it's going to be chatty. So is that API that you're using for your JavaScript application, is that going to be the same API as if you're doing a, a live content server? Why not? So you need an API that's going to be able to handle multiple different uh, use cases, and it's going to be lots and lots of small requests. Drupal does not handle lots and lots of small requests very well right now. It handles a modest number of really big requests with caching really well, but not where loading one page requires eight different PHP loads. These are my, I'm talking about microservices now. Could we have a Drupal based on microservices? Could Drupal itself be a microservice, part of several? Could it be a collection of microservices that you can swap in and out? Maybe. Do we need it to be? Maybe. Looking at the real-time web, by that I mean new web technologies that PHP as we use it don't, just can't handle. Things like event source, which is so old and no one uses it anymore, I couldn't even find a logo for it. Because really, these days, everyone's using WebSockets. You can't use WebSockets with Drupal. Everyone doing WebSockets with Drupal is doing, a, doing the WebSocket part in Node.js. But even that may fade out in favor of HTTP2, which is going to be present on the majority of servers and the majority, majority of browsers in the world within 12 months. 
and does push web even better than WebSockets in terms of the server is able to push new information to a client when it decides it needs it, when it decides it's relevant. All of these require a persistent connection between the server and the client. Persistent connection with server push, where the server is able to push out data. Can you do that with Drupal today? No. The way we run, run Drupal is completely inadequate for many of these use cases. This is much more fundamental. Why? Well, we don't have any persistent connection capability. We get one request and one response, and that's it, and Drupal shuts down, and if a second request comes in, we have to redo our entire bootstrap. Oi, and our bootstrap is not cheap. Also, everything in Drupal is blocking I.O. If you have uh, an incoming request that's not doing all that much, it's still going to block on, on its I.O. You're going to sit there and wait on talking to the database, even if it's talking to the cache. You don't want that for REST APIs that are going to be very, very chatty. The underlying problem here is CGI, the Common Gateway Interface. It's developed by uh, NCSA in 1993. I suspect there are people in this room younger than CGI. And this is still the way that we're running Drupal, because it's the way most people run PHP. It's a specification for calling command line executables from a web request. That's the actual description. And it works by setting up a bunch of environment variables based on an incoming request, and I say based on rather loosely, passing it to a script or a command line tool, and then shutting down at the end. This is where everything in dollar server comes from. Why is dollar server in PHP just so weird? Because CGI. This shared nothing design that PHP is known for cannot keep up with high levels of constant rapid request because it has that boot up cost every time. There's a, all the process management in the operating system. It has to hand off from Apache to PHP or from uh, Nginx to, fast G, to your fast CGI daemon. You get no persistence between requests. You cannot save any of that overhead. You have no running process that can decide to push data to an active client. So you, web services or uh, web sockets are just not a thing. How much effort did we put into Drupal 8 trying to make our boot up process faster for that reason? A ton. This, we did a lot to compromise our architecture in the name of performance for exactly this reason. Because otherwise, it would take you know, 300 milliseconds baseline for every request. And that's just not acceptable. Oh, I already have those. It's time, I argue, to leave CGI behind and move Drupal and PHP past 1993. Yeah. What? Yes, I'm saying mod PHP, fast CGI, not a thing. What else is there? Let me introduce you to the world of non-CGI PHP. And I mean it. And I don't mean command line tools either. I mean tools like React PHP. Basically, it's Node.js, but written in PHP. It's an oversimplification, but that's a decent explanation. <clears throat> and if you're doing WebSockets in PHP, these days, this is the tool for it, is React. They've got WebSocket libraries. Uh, I've actually talked with uh, their, their development leads. Um, it's a decent enough system, and it's much faster than CGI. This, here's a very basic web server using React. We create uh, yeah, an event loop, do some wiring, ignore the, de the details, that's not relevant for the moment. Listen on to a request event with, uh, here's our callable, here's our actual app, and then run. And it just, this is running from the command line, and this just sits here waiting on this port for incoming requests. Incoming uh, request comes in, passes off to this, uh, this callable, it sends back you know, your headers and, and text and returns. And notice, it's persistent. You have data that persists between requests because it's a single running process. You are not tearing it down every time. So who cares if this takes 400, 500 milliseconds to set up? You do it once and never touch it again. 
This lets you, then you need to multiplex though, because you know, if, you, if you're handling a single request at a time, there's one process, and you pause on one request to look something up in the database, which takes you know, 30 milliseconds. At <coughs> 30 milliseconds, you're not talking to any other request. That's no good either. So React, <coughs> excuse me, handles asynchronous I.O. And by asynchronous, what I really mean is non-blocking. Everyone calls it asynchronous. Non-blocking is really what we're, what we're talking about. Non-blocking I.O. is where you pass an I.O. request off to the operating system and say, here, take care of this. Your call to the OS returns immediately. It doesn't wait for that request to finish. It just returns. <coughs> and you check, you, you trust the OS is going to take care of it. And you'll come back and check later and see if there's a response or if there's something else you need to do or if there's an error or whatever. And this is something PHP is completely capable of doing. It's not done often, but it's completely capable of doing. Unfortunately, the API for it is based on C and is therefore god-awful. Case in point. <laughs> Create a new socket, set it non-blocking, connect it to an IP address, uh, we can write something to it, and then socket select, which is, hey, is there a socket in this array that is ready, that has data for me? If so, do something with it else. Yeah, I'll go do something else for a while and then come back and check it later for some definition of later. This is um, <clears throat> very, very uh, basic. And please don't write this yourself. React PHP takes care of all of this under the hood for you. That's why it exists, because this is a pain in the butt to work with yourself. You also don't want to have lots and lots of callbacks like we, we saw before, because that gets to terrible, terrible code. So instead, it uses something called promises. Who's used promises in JavaScript? Pretty much the exact same API React has an implementation of. It's a way of solving the nested callback problem and letting you defer execution when you're doing something asynchronously. So this is a highly contrived example. So we have the, this function call that's going to get some data from the database asynchronously. <clears throat> And so we say, all right, when uh, data comes back, if there is an error, mark the, this deferred object, this promise, as rejected. If there was real data, give it the data, or, uh, the result, pass it on. But this is all in a closure. So this only happens sometime later when data actually comes back. What we return is a promise that says, there will be data here eventually, and you can act on it eventually. And so called db fetch, which returns this promise immediately. Meanwhile, the operating system is busy talking to the database. And we can keep on going and define these other callbacks on it. Say, all right, when the data comes in, then fetch a row out of it, and then, then do something with that record. This is how ES6 in JavaScript is going to be working. This is how you do asynchronous in any, pretty much any modern system is doing async. Um, in a single process is doing it this way. You may have heard people say that Node.js is faster than PHP. Well, they're wrong. What is true is that doing asynchronous I.O., non-blocking I.O., is way faster than blocking I.O. if you have an I.O. intensive task. So another PHP developer named Phil Sturgeon uh, t took this challenge and benchmarked Node.js versus React PHP. And once both were properly configured, ignore the blue line for a moment, the yellow line is PHP's uh, performance, the red line is Node's, and they're pretty well neck and neck the whole way. No matter how many uh, requests it's, <clears throat> it's making at once. Because PHP is not actually the slow part. Blocking I.O. was the slow part. By the way, this was done with PHP 5.5, PHP 7 is twice as fast. All right, if this isn't your style, it's another new tool called Icicle in PHP. Who's heard of Icicle? I figured you who would have. Icicle uses generators. Generators are a new feature in PHP 5.5 that are seriously cool. At a limited level, they're kind of a shortcut for iterators. <clears throat> so you have a function, and instead of returning a value, you can yield a value. 
This Python people, you probably recognize this. It's based on Python style. And what this does is when you call it, instead of returning <coughs> a value, it returns an iterator object. So each time, um, when you iterate over it then, <coughs> called next essentially, it will run until it does yield and return that value. And the next time you call next on it, it just picks up where it left off and keeps on running until it hits the end. So normally you've called the range function PHP. You get you know, with uh, one to one billion, you would get an array with one billion items in it, which is not good for your memory. Instead, with uh, this approach, it's generating the values on the fly, and so we never blow out our memory. This is a very simple contrived example. Generators can do some really, really cool stuff beyond this. They can greatly simplify your code in certain areas. Uh, and this works for methods too. Any, any function or method can be a generator. You can also send data to a generator. So in this case, we call pow, and the first, and it will run up until this first yield. And then it will, you know, we, uh, we send a value to it, and it assigns that value to val, and then it continues running until it yields that result, which gets sent back and printed. Then the next time we call it, it picks up here, assigns that value, and so on and so on and so on. We have functions that we can pause mid-operation and come back to later. And so we get you know, 25, 9, and done. But we can do other stuff in the middle here. The function's just going to sit there happily. What happens if that generator <laughs> is doing asynchronous I.O.? Again, contrived example, but we've got some kind of asynchronous socket. We send data to it, and it writes it out on that socket asynchronously and comes back. So now this yield, I'm not actually re even returning data. I'm just letting the data be brought in to this process. And so that's, great to, what's, that's what get out, gets output. And this seems really ridiculously weird. And it seemed ridiculously weird to me, too, the first several times I looked at it. And what follows, you may not follow, you may not understand the first time, but once you start to understand them, they're really cool. Coroutines. Coroutines, according to Wikipedia, are program components that are for non-preemptive multitasking, allowing multiple entry points for superseding and resuming execution. Functions that you can pause mid-execution come back to later. They can say, hey, someone else can have a turn for a while. Icicle is built on this approach, which lets the code look a lot more like the code we're used to writing. <clears throat> so in this case, um, we set up our server, we uh, set it to run, <clears throat> and when a request comes in, we just yield our, our uh, data. Every time we say yield, that yields back to the core runtime of Icicle, and it lets other stuff run. So these lines do not run immediately after each other. Any number of things could happen in between them. These will ha still happen in the same order, guaranteed. But who knows what could be handling happening in the middle here. Combine this with asynchronous I.O., and you get a very straightforward, very fast environment. I took this and wrote a very simple uh, router for it, just proof of concept. <clears throat> so let's say, pretend this is the entire kernel for your application. We get the request in, we figure out what our action is going to be, our controller essentially, and then we yield that action which means this will get dovetailed in between other parts of the request, including other requests. It still looks like we're calling that and saving the value, but we're also telling Icicle, you can pause me here and come back to me later once the I.O. is done and I actually have a value. And all of that logic is handled under the hood, and you can ignore the rest of this for the, for the time being, other than you're still yielding. <clears throat> Icicle has promises, too. They work similar. In this case, we can say we've got a you know, DNS resolver um, that we're going to use. We're going to wrap that up in a coroutine and then use promises on it. I'll let you read this code later. I'm going to post it later. Um, for the time being, just understand this is happening. 
There are several frameworks I have not mentioned doing this kind of stuff in PHP today. And because they're a persistent daemon, this can do WebSockets. This can do HTTP2. This can do all the kind of stuff that we need to do in order to support the business cases we talked about before. Who's worked with HHVM? A couple of people, OK? This is Facebook's re-implementation of PHP because they needed something more high performance. It's mostly compatible with PHP. There's uh, a couple of things they don't support yet they're still working on. Uh, it is much, much faster than PHP 5.5 or 5.6. PHP 7 pretty much just caught up. Uh, but it also has this thing called Hack. Hack is one of the worst named languages in the universe. It's an extension to PHP itself with a lot of new syntax uh, for new capabilities, many of which have since made their way back into PHP itself. Things like scalar types, which are going to be in PHP 7 and are going to be awesome, started in hacks, in hack. A lot of other things, uh, they have generics already, the constructor promotion, short lambda syntax, which is also being considered for PHP itself at this point. But most importantly for us, native async primitives. So this is uh, from the hack manual. Let's say we have a function here that we're going to mark as async. And this one is async, async. And then we can say, all right, let those functions run and wait here until all of them are done. If they're doing uh, asynchronous I.O., which I left out of the slide because it's too big to fit on a slide, then the runtime itself can switch back and forth between those two whenever it needs to to keep the CPU busy and not just sitting there waiting on I.O. And this is built into the engine. And then we get all of our data back. And so we get the result of both of these. Now imagine doing this to render blocks in parallel in Drupal. What's the performance gain of that? What's the architecture gain of that? Pretty huge. That's what we were trying to do in the first place. Now imagine that every, all of your I.O. is async capable. They don't have drivers for everything yet, but suppose you do. You can say, all right, all of these, I'm just going to say, you know, run all of these things. Let them all uh, do their thing asynchronously. The CPU will sort it out. The operating system will sort it out. The operating system is way faster than we are. And when all of them are done, get back those results as an array. Again, very contrived example. But imagine what you can do if you can say, oh, I've got these eight blocks on the page. They're all cached. Thunk! Suck them all out of the cache at once, glue them together, print. Now imagine if you can make all of your I.O. asynchronous when serving REST requests. Can you, you know, get 60%, 80% performance improvements? Quite possibly. You can fork PHP processes. Not if they're running as uh, CGI, but you can fork PHP processes from the command line. I've actually built apps like this. Uh, we did one a couple of years ago called Kiwi, which was a, a joke because it is a connector for a system called Emu, and both of which are flightless birds. <clears throat> um, and this is essentially how the system worked. It was a command line tool, but uh, we had some number of workers, and we just fork and say, all right, if we, you know, we fork for the number of child processors we have, and if it's the parent, do nothing. If it's a child process, then go do whatever the work is. They're splitting up between multiple child processes. And then wait for them all to finish. And so the parent process just pauses there until all the children are done. And this gave us a twofold improvement over not doing it this way. But this also means that we have completely shared memory up until the point of the fork. And the operating system doesn't actually duplicate the memory. We can have five, six, seven, eight processes running all with the same memory usage, same memory space in the operating system. <clears throat> and those processes, they could be blocking, or those could be asynchronous too. Imagine take, doing something like this. Super simple example. We have a non-blocking uh, forking server. We have you set up our socket, then just loop and say, all right, is there something to do? If not, come back in a moment. If so, 
fork, let the child process handle the, that incoming request, and let the parent go back to waiting. Or we could pre, you know, predefine a couple of uh, processes and create a pool of them that are sitting there waiting, and we can hand off, hand off from the parent request to those child requests or child processes every time there's a request, which is exactly how Apache works. We could re-implement Apache in PHP and never have to bootstrap again. Obviously, this is a terribly buggy and, uh, and error-prone way of doing it. There are various libraries that wrap this up in a much safer fashion. Um, one of them, Icicle Concurrent, is a process manager uh, that's using channels uh, for communicating between processes, kind of inspired by Go. I said, there are other tools like this as well. This is what's happening in the PHP world today. All of these are happening today. I've been talking to some of the PHP internals developers, including uh, some who work on both HHVM and on PHP. Will we get async primitives in PHP 7.1, 7.2? I put the odds at better than 50% PHP has native async primitives in the language before 2020. What are we going to do with those? Are we ready to use those? Will that let us do the push persistent connections we, that we're going to need to do? Will this let us have multiple configurations of Drupal? Which of these approaches is going to win? Async, forking, React style, generator style with Icicle? Well, I was hoping to be able to tell you which was going to be successful, but uh, to be perfectly honest, I have no idea. I have no idea which of these approaches is going to end up the, the successful future of PHP. What I will predict is that CGI is not going to go away entirely because shared nothing does have a lot of advantages to it. It does simplify a lot of problems that if we're working with these other types of architectures become relevant. <clears throat> but we are going to need to work in other environments. We're going to need to use Drupal in situations where we can't afford a bootstrap on every incoming request. We're going to need to use Drupal to do WebSockets. We're going to need to use Drupal to do server push with HTTP2. These are going to be hard requirements on us if we want to compete. We are going to need, be able to need to run in both modes. We're going to need to be able to run Drupal as a standalone server like now or as a split brain decoupled system or as a high performance REST server or several of those at the same time. So how do we make Drupal both monolithic and decoupled at the same time? That's our challenge. That's what we can do today to get ready for whatever the future looks like. Any of these, I don't know. What we need to do is support different configurations of common Drupal components. The same underlying components arranged and architected in different ways but still the same underlying code. So that we don't have to produce eight different versions of Drupal, we just have eight different wirings of Drupal. How do we do that? Well, here's our first clue. Components. We need reusable components that can run in any of these modes. Or some other mode I haven't mentioned because I don't know about it yet, because it hasn't been invented. We need reusable components. What makes a, re a component reusable? In PHP, this list should look familiar. It should be stateless. No state means it doesn't matter how many requests are running through the code at the same time, they won't bump into each other. It means value objects. It means immutable objects that we know are not going to pollute other threads. It means not a single global anywhere in the system. One single global destroys your ability to keep your processes separate or your requests separate if you have a single process. It means we need to stop having global dependencies on the request. The request stack is Symfony's way of handling um, sub-requests. <clears throat> we're using it as well. And that's not quite going to cut it because keeping track of that context gets very, very interesting. We need code that is not dependent on our service container. Why? Because the Symfony service container is a great tool for a CGI-based system. But if we're running in a persistent daemon, we don't need all of this compiling stuff. 
all this compiled container, it, it's not necessary. It's there for performance when you have shared nothing. If you don't have shared nothing, you don't need to waste time on that. We need to wire it differently. We may want to use a completely different container in different configurations. So the more code we have that is independent of the container, the easier that becomes. Any I.O. we have needs to be isolated into very specific classes because that's the stuff we're going to have to rewrite for each case. So keep your I.O. in very specific classes that do nothing other than talk to third parties because that's the stuff that gets rewritten. The rest of the code shall be stateless services that we can just reuse anywhere. <clears throat> this is easier if you rely on third-party code. If that third-party code is well-written, great. You don't have to maintain it. The PHP community as a whole can maintain it. Dare I say, this is what qualifies for purely functional code. You know me. Yes, I dare. These are the same clean code standards we've been pushing for years. This is why Drupal 8 made such a big shift from the old PHP 4 style architecture towards a more modern OO architecture. This is why we push for stateless services. This is why we have value objects in places. This is why, because this opens the door to these kind of changes. What are the, the hard parts still going to be? Well, Entity API um, has most of the problems I just listed. It's far too many statics, far too many service dependencies. It's going to be a problem. It's a problem we have to fix if we ever want to serve entities using WebSockets. If you want to serve entities using WebSockets, we have to fix this. Render API, the render context system is great for what it does. It's great for the architecture we have now. I really don't know what's going to happen if we try to put that into an asynchronous environment. It might actually work. I haven't tried. But it's a concern point. Anything that's container aware means it's coupled to a single container. If you have code in Drupal or in a module that is container aware, beware. You are coupling to an architecture that may not be around in five years or may not be the only one you need to worry about in five years. As I mentioned, request stack. It's designed for sub-requests, not for asynchronous work. So this may be a problem, too. We may need to, to separate, separate from that. Which means, do we need to tr start putting our code into separate repositories? Do we need to break core up into separate repositories to force ourselves to do this kind of separation? Maybe. I don't know. We might. Because even just with the components we have now, it's been really hard to convince people to not introduce subtle little dependencies without realizing it and saying, oh, it's just one little dependency. No, one little dependency breaks all of this. Thread-safe code, which is what we're talking about here, stateless, thread-safe, reentrant code, can really easily be used in CGI mode. We can still use it in the traditional fashion, but not vice versa. Code that relies on a bunch of globals that get destroyed at the end of the request will not work at all in anything other than CGI. All of this other code, aside from a couple of yield statements, will work in CGI. It'll work in any of them. So let's write the best code we can and hedge our bets. It's also testable. Everything I just said makes code more testable, too. If your code is more easily testable, you're probably getting the rest of this right, too. They all play on each other. This is not, you know, this sounds huge, but quite frankly, this is within sight. I can see us pulling this off in five years. Why? Because of the work we've already done. Because of the work we've already done to refactor the system. Because most of the system is now stateless services. Not all of it. Most of it. Most of the system is not container aware. Too many things are. Most of it is not. We are closer to this today than Drupal 7 was to Drupal 8, I would argue. The distance from 7 to 8 that we have already covered is a bigger shift than what the actual work required to prepare for whatever this future holds. As long as we don't slide backwards, as long as we don't get lazy and start reintroducing shortcuts that make things easier for right now but actually type the couple things again. So please don't do that. I am sure some of you out there are saying, but what if you're wrong? Raise your hand if you're in this category. Peter? <laughs> If 
Five years sounds too slow if what I'm saying is true. Could be. <laughs> I mean, th these are refactorings that we can do. Every contrib module should be thinking this way. And this is a guideline for how we improve Drupal 8 within the Drupal 8 lifetime. This is not a, we start rewriting Drupal today. No, 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 no. This is a, as we are improving Drupal 8 over the next several years, these are the guidelines to keep in mind. And if I'm wrong, and in 2020, synchronous CGI is still the only game in town for PHP, and I don't know, HTTP2 just never really takes off, right? Well, then all we're left with is a highly decoupled, highly testable, highly reusable, shareable code base full of loosely coupled components. Awesome! <laughs> Some resources uh, to follow up on. I will post these slides. It's linked to React, to iSkull. Doorman is a uh, PHP process manager. They have forked environments. Um, HHVM's documentation. Some links to the uh, PHP manual. Uh, and some other articles that I recommend reading. As I said, it took me a while to wrap my brain around most of this. So if your brain is fried right now, don't worry, you're in good company. Most people's brains are fried at this point. But I do recommend taking time, read through some of these articles, maybe multiple times, and uh, you know, think about what, just how far can we go? Just how, how far can we push this to make Drupal a WebSocket-friendly HTTP2-based decoupled powerhouse. Thank you. So we do have time for questions. So if there's a microphone here, please use it. Unless I've just melted everyone's brain way too much. <laughs> It's over there. <laughs> hey, Larry. It's Peter Willannon. Um, <laughs> so in terms of pushing content to devices and things, how do we have Drupal do that and also serve web pages in a way that maybe um, it makes sense to terminate the request and clean up because you just built a huge whack of HTML versus, you know, just pushing out a little mm -hmm. notification where you might want, want a long-running daemon. Are we going to have to have Drupal running on the same server somehow in the same mode or running on two servers talking to the same database in two modes? How do you how do you get sort of the current behavior of actually serving web pages and this push uh, WebSockets behavior? That's an excellent question. A um, couple of possibilities. You could have a common data store uh, server, that's where all your entities live, and then a CGI front end and a, um, a WebSocket front end that are running on separate servers. You could have a persistent daemon that, on an incoming request, uh, can up, you know, upgrade it from HTTP 1.1 to WebSockets or to HTTP 2, and then that request stays open. It's, a, it's its own fork process or it's a separate track uh, process in uh, PHP itself. So like if you can do very simple like chat servers and stuff with React PHP in a matter of an hour or two. And then it maintains an open connection to every uh, client that's connected to the server. And then I'd see no reason why it couldn't. Oh, this request is asking for an HTML page rather than being a WebSocket connection. So I'll just serve its thing and drop that connection at the end. Yes, that means that we need it, doing so needs to clean up after itself and not have all these statics and giant render arrays that we built up. That's the point. And that's exactly what we need to be doing in order to support, I don't know which of these architectures. Hi. Um, I was wondering, do you know what uh, Symfony is already doing to implement this or what it means for the integration with Symfony? I am not aware of Symfony doing anything in this regard at this point. That said, I haven't really asked. Um, I suspect Symfony will remain a very good shared nothing architecture uh, framework. But in five years, who knows? You know, I, I'm trying to look further ahead than anything currently in the market that is in actual use. 
React PHP is the, and HHVM are the only tools here I mentioned that are in actual use right now. Uh, Icicle is still in beta, maybe alpha. Um, so I think a lot of Symfony's architecture could work fairly well, actually. The HTTP kernel architecture could work very well here. In five years, I would not be surprised if Symfony had also switched to PSR7, the HTTP request and response standard, which was designed with this kind of thing in mind. That's why it's value objects, and why, that's why it's immutable, to simplify exactly this kind of what is now esoteric, but in the future may not be esoteric use cases. So my hope is that the Symfony components will remain good decoupled components, and we can keep using them or not as it makes sense architecturally at the time. Thank you. Uh, first of all, great talk, really. And many of the things you said uh, above all in the early beginning uh, reminded me of application servers in Java, like, I don't know, JPOS, Tomcat, and stuff like that, multi-threading. So I was wondering, is there anything in the works for PHP, or are there very compelling reasons for, do, for doing that in the user space, aside from, I don't know, portability? In terms of the PHP engine, uh, as I said, there's talk of asynchronous primitives in the language itself. Whether or not those will happen, I don't know. I think it's likely that within five years we'll get something. Uh, there was talk about bringing um, an, a better event loop library into PHP itself, like libEV or libEvent, uh, which are the options that Node.js uses too. Um, it, I think, again, a lot, of the, a lot of work went into PHP 7 under the hood to clean up its code to make it possible to do this kind of stuff in 7.1, 7.2, 7.3. Will we ever get re like a Tomcat equivalent? I'm gonna guess no, because aside from some high performance pieces like the event loop, there's probably not a reason to do it in the engine itself. Uh, and there's plenty of people who actually don't think it should be. So yeah, I, at least half of the implementation of these things is going to be user space is my guess, but I could be wrong. Thanks. So um, if we assume that, well, um, uh, I, I love all this great new stuff uh, and I can't wait to get started. Mm -hmm. I don't want to wait until 2020. I don't <laughs> want to wait until Drupal 9. Is there going to be a way, in your opinion, that this can be cleanly done in a Drupal project before it is part of Drupal core? Oh. The whole thing, perhaps not. I'd say, so the project I mentioned before uh, that I did was a decoupled system was Drupal as a behind the firewall editorial CMS, pretty much Drupal 7 as is. It dumped data to Elasticsearch and then we had a Silex app sitting in front of that. So stuff like that you can do today. There's a lot of people who have done projects like that. Um, in terms of breaking up Drupal itself, um, I think taking Drupal data and dumping it to some intermediary and then putting something else in front of it is one of the architectures and the fact that then the other half is not Drupal right now, well, we can change that later. But then that's where all the front end is. Do that front end using something that uses Twig and it's a transferable skill set. Um, Entity API is really the big challenge, to be honest. Ent Entity API and views are the most important parts of Drupal. I would say, Entity API and Views. Everything else is tools to build that. And so Entity API not being this kind of fully cleanly decoupled is problematic. I'd love to see someone try. Okay, can we put Entity API in a persistent daemon? What happens if we do that? What are we actually gonna run, run into that breaks horribly? I'm not entirely sure. Volunteers welcome to figure that out and then feed that back in for, okay, some of these things that are breaking, can we fix them without changing APIs? I'm gonna predict some yes, some no. The ones we can fix without breaking APIs, let's do. Let's just start now cleaning things up in that direction. We can do that within the Drupal 8 cycle. Um, those are milestones along those feature branches Dries was talking about this morning. And see what happens. Again, worst case scenario, Entity API becomes better. Oh, how terrible. Thanks. 
Anyone else? All right. Thanks for coming. Please leave feedback. Enjoy the party tonight. <laughs>